all that. All good? Okay. Call the meeting to order. And uh, Victoria, if you would call the roll, please. Sure will. Mrs. Summers. Sure. Dr. Hans. Mrs. Raspecki. Here. Dr. Arrington. Here. Ms. Newman. Here. Dr. Taub. Here. Dr. Klotz. Here. Ms. Schulman. Here. Mr. Rubin. Here. Ms. Kucherik. Here. Mr. Landsman. Mr. Furman. Here. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is our first opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak at this time? We have another opportunity at the end of the meeting. I guess we will move on to the first item on our agenda, which is the uh, Michigan Department of Corrections contract. Kathleen. Hey. 10 prepaid inpatient health plans have been meeting with the Department of Corrections. They're very interested in forging a relationship, a contractual relationship with us to manage the services that they currently provide to individuals re uh, leaving the prisons or correctional facilities. So this PowerPoint presentation pertains to that, and we wanted to give you an update on where we are with our discussions. So the purpose of this uh, contract would really be to connect people released from prison to care, and I would probably say quick care or early care. Many individuals leave the prisons now, and a number of them find their way to our public mental health system because they qualify for services. But the intent is to really create pathways with the Department of Corrections in consort with the local correctional staff, the probation officers, parole officers, who would work with us. And I might say that this really is a focus on substance use hence the name Substance Use Treatment Services. So those are the direct services that the Department of Corrections is overseeing right now. Uh, the intent, of, of course, is to ensure quality services and supports. They do have a provider network uh, right now that provides services to people who leave prison, and those services are therapies and supports specific to individuals who may have substance use issues, who have uh, anger management issues, and uh, work that is specifically needed uh, to ensure that they're successful in their return to their home community. We will be working with the department to track outcome measures, and one of the things I asked, a number of us asked in our work with them, that we put a cost to that. I think many of you know that this is a touch point that was discussed in the CARES Task Force um, document. There were recommendations around that, and I know often people talk about the broken mental health system when indeed it is the, a touch point issue. So we really believe by forging a contract with the Department of Corrections, we can better serve across systems people who are leaving uh, the prisons. We, of course, will work cohesively with the other PIHPs who choose to, or their boards who choose to enter into contract with the Department of Corrections. So again, uh, the intent is to manage the service and the, the network on behalf of the Department of Corrections. So they will be funding us separately for this service. Uh, they will be providing administrative costs separately for this service. So the intent is to basically uh, ensure that the service is delivered, costs are covered, yet uh, there will be no threat to our current line of service in the public mental health system. Uh, we will, it says combine, it really probably should have said we would braid dollars uh, because again, many people do come to our system, so a lot of people qualify for Healthy Michigan and by doing so, they would qualify for services through our funding stream. 
there would be a funding stream for additional therapies and supports through the Department of Corrections. And again, uh, we would uh, manage a provider network. I might note that there are a number of providers in substance use providers in our current provider network who are also contracting with the Department of Corrections. Some are not, so we would be uh, taking a hard look at that current provider network. We have certain standards, and we've been talking to the Department of Corrections around that, so we want to ensure a quality provider network, but that we will also be working with our current provider, substance use provider network, to see if they would like to also provide uh, supports to people exiting prison. Impact on people served, I've already talked a little bit about that. There would be early intervention. And some of this is also making sure that people do gain access to Healthy Michigan or any other Medicaid or other entitlements that they might have. It does provide a single point of access or service authorization. So instead of uh, people being served through the Department of Corrections directly and through our public mental health system directly, there will be that one point of contact. Uh, we do believe by combining services, there will be a better chance for recovery, not only from substance use concerns, but also mental health. And I think you know that the percentage of people who also have mental health concerns is very, very high for people with substance use issues. And of course, our approach is not only treatment, but prevention. So we'll be working with that network in the community at large. There will be staff needs, and so we will uh, develop a net, uh, staffing a ratio or a staffing composition based on, our contra on the contractual expectations. I might say at this point in time, we don't know exactly how many people we're talking about. Uh, we expect there might be a little bit of an uptake in the connections with us, but uh, again, the Department of Corrections has indicated based on the number of people who have uh, a need for services, the needs to manage a provider network, uh, they will ensure that we have administrative dollars to build the staffing infrastructure to support this contract. The people who will be hired will be employed by the PIHP, or in this case, by our organization. So we would need to add staff to the substance use team, or quality team or wherever it is needed. We do work across teams, so again, we'll ensure we have sufficient staff. And again, the, the staff costs are covered by an administrative budget provided by the Department of Corrections. There are some statistics. Uh, almost 90% of people who exit prison are enrolled in Healthy Michigan. And uh, so again, they may have easy access already to our system. I do know that uh, some other PIHPs or CMHs in other parts of the state are concerned about uh, people exiting prison and what that means to the public mental health system. Uh, there is a stigma certainly with that also, and we're seeing some of that, but again, I think uh, Many of the people coming to us for services also have uh, justice system or correctional system experiences in their background. So it's not a group of people that we are unfamiliar with. There is a need for medical necessity. So if they do come to us for services and they qualify again, we provide those services. If they do not rise to the eligibility criteria, the Department of Corrections will continue to pay the cost to support the services for people exiting the prison. So it's not as if uh, they would all people would be coming into our public mental health system. But at this point in time, we don't know exactly what the ratio might be. <clears throat> we become a benefits manager, as it's called. Um, certainly, we are one now for the public mental health system. And there are a lot of touch points. Uh, there are benefits to all these various groups, to the communities, people served, providers, the department, and certainly taxpayers. And I want to quickly go through a few of those benefits. In terms of the community benefit, 
We have greater local connections and governance. Right now, again, the Department of Corrections is very centralized out of their Lansing office in terms of management of services at the local level and oversight. So that, that will come to the local PIHP to do that service. Again, there's direct access uh, to programs and reports uh, and we are able then to work with our community partners to improve, improve services for people exiting the correction system. And again, um, working with our, our partners around prevention, treatment, any other social supports, community planning, for instance, our connections with the public uh, health system, uh, we will use our experience and our data to ensure that we have all populations groups represented in the health department's uh, health, healthy plan for Oakland. In terms of people served, again, there's a single point of contact. We actually have already started to forge a more uh, a close, or a closer, I should say, working relationship with the parole officers in our county. We had an early interest in working with the corrections department and had been a meeting with the folks from Lansing, the head of the Corrections Behavioral Health Unit, and some of the people from the prisons because we knew we were already serving people. So we can only improve our working relationships at the local level. And again, there'll be enhanced services, prevention, and treatment, not only in substance use, but for mental health uh, concerns. Provider benefits, um, again, many of the uh, providers in the public mental health system in the OCHN um, provider network also work with the Department of Corrections. So this really streams, streamlines contractual relationships for many of them. Um, they, we will use uh, multiple funding streams to, again, braid the funding uh, revenue uh, to provide uh, funding for the services and supports that are needed. And one of the things we look at will be the standardization of rates and quality performance. I might say, um, I probably should have up front, there are several of us who have worked over the last number of months very closely on this activity. Certainly Christina Nicholas has been right in the middle of this and she actually has been uh, putting fingers to the keyboard and crafting the scope of work, uh, basically on behalf of all PIHPs. Anya has been very involved in crafting some contract language around administrative funding and service funding rate setting, and she'll talk a little more about that too. So uh, there's, I have also been sitting on the administrative support group or the administrative group meeting with the other PIHPs to really take a hard look at the contract and make sure that we develop something that's very uh, workable and very consistent across the state. The benefits to the Department of Corrections, certainly there would be a decentralization of management, but they would, in essence, go from about 55 contracts that they directly manage to around 10 because of the 10 regions. Um, they would be able to leverage our experience and benefits management. Uh, they do pay uh, providers, but we find that there's uh, a learning curve, perhaps, on service delivery, on utilization management, and performance management, pay for performance. And so we're bringing some of our experience to that and really to the entire state, again, because Anya is very involved and we do are moving into value-based purchasing and we manage outcomes around that. Uh, uniformity of contract and standardization of services is what we're looking for and coordination of funding or braided of funding is a benefit to all actually. The next slide talks about taxpayer benefit and certainly the wise use of public funds. You often hear that from us. That is our mantra, not only here locally, but as we talk statewide, there will be administrative efficiencies, obviously, when you go from managing 55 contracts 
to 10. Uh, so for the department, there's administrative efficiencies, the braiding of funding for a holistic service to a person exiting the system uh, can create nothing but uh, better outcomes for the cost. And there will be uh, more local responsibility and accountability, not only for us through their management of the contract, but also in terms of their expectations of parole officers and their staff working with us at a closer level locally. Okay, as Kathleen mentioned, um, this does add a new fund source for us. Um, this is uh, funding directly through the Michigan Department of Corrections. And um, at minimum for the first fiscal year, the de um, Department of Corrections plans to fund us on a fee-for-service model. So you guys are familiar with that. We provide the service, or the, our provider provides the service, and we get reimbursed. So that would be um, for any service that is outside of what we would already cover. So if somebody meets criteria for substance use services within our network, we would cover that anyway with um, Medicaid block grant or Healthy Michigan. But if there are any services that are provided outside of that benefit, the Department of Corrections would be covering that. So in addition to what we are paying providers, there will also be a negotiated administrative amount. So part of this is for us to do the, the back office work. So the um, collection of claims, the fund source allocation, um, the reimbursement to providers, um, and network management in general. So we're working through those processes right now, um, but it does not pose any risk to our organization because it is a fee-for-service model. Um, and we um, will be able to utilize those fund sources to help um, with recidivism for the people served by that, for that population. Okay, so what are we talking about? Certainly for us, the ge geographical area is Oakland County. What we have uh, discovered in the course of these conversations with the Department of Corrections is that there are uh, a couple of regions who are um, feeling unease around contracting with the Department of Corrections. Uh, as I indicated earlier, some of it has to do with perhaps stigma and people coming from the prisons and the belief that the public mental health system uh, is not the primary system to serve people coming from the prisons. Uh, there may be uh, some situations where uh, the internal management of the PIHP is such that the number of people served would not make it to their benefit to contract. So we have heard that Region 2, which is the northern part of Michigan, the I think on the map would be the gray area on the upper part of the mitten, as they call it, uh, is uh, not interested at this point in time uh, in contracting with the Department of Corrections. We have had conversations with the Department of Corrections. They have asked us if we would be interested in perhaps contracting for that region. So it's important for us to let you know at this point in time that there may be other geographical areas across the state where the Department of Corrections would like us to step up and do the work. Clearly, they are aware of who we are because we have been so actively involved in crafting the scope of work, the contract, the financial implications around this. So as we go forward, um, the intent is to bring a contract uh, to this organization, but there, we may also be talking to you about potential approval for other regions. What that might look like at this point in time, I don't know. We had preliminary conversation with the Department of Corrections. They asked us a few more questions on how we would work with other PIHPs. We would certainly be moving into a geographical area where there are community mental health organizations and a PIHP. I've had conversations with one uh, from uh, the CEO from the northern region and uh, certainly was appreciative of any uh, work that we might do and how we could collaborate. So there was a welcoming, at least a welcoming uh, conversation should that occur. Uh, I just might let you know that it appears there may be some other PIHPs who are taking a hard look at this, whether because of uh, concerns about serving people from the prisons or it could be because of their financial 
uh, situation as it currently exists and the number of people served. So um, we will be meeting, when I say we, I on, on behalf of this organization and uh, Christina Nicholas will be attending a meeting later this week on the 20th. We will be meeting with the Department of Corrections. They have asked the Attorney General's office to be there so that we could go through the contract that has been forged uh, mutually forged over the last number of months and at least finalize the contract so that uh, the PIHPs can take it to their boards for review and approval. And at this point in time, uh, according to our mutual time frame, they would hope, we would hope that we would be able to bring a contract to this board for approval on the 16th of October, which would be the next full board meeting. Are there any questions? Uh, the first question I have is the logistics of this. I mean, we're looking at a, uh, a territory that's two to 300 miles away from us. Do you perceive any challenges in trying to fulfill the a contract or provide service? Well, you know, one of the things we'd have to do is certainly build the staffing structure to be able to do that. That would mean a uh, a, tra a person who travels, a satellite office, working with the PIHP in that region, the substance use director, uh, Christina Nicholas's counterpoint uh, in that region to be able to provide services. It's my understanding in that region that the number of people exiting is quite small, the, the provider network is small, so the challenges wouldn't be huge, but certainly uh, geographically we'd have to have a presence and hire, uh, hire somebody who would be able to be uh, available to provide our network and work with people in that region. I don't think it's insurmountable. There are a lot of businesses that have satellite offices and work remotely. I had a couple of questions. Um, Anya, with the financial implications, you mentioned that there would be services outside of what we normally do SUD-wise that the Department of Corrections would pick up, what would some of those services be? Um, there's just, still... It doesn't have to be all of them, just a couple. Um, so, they're like specific therapies related to criminogenic factors, um, therapies, so things like that, uh, residential treatment and other types of things. It's just a handful, and we are actually trying to use the codes consistently that we're used to using just for an efficiency um, as people are authorizing and reporting codes. Um, so it's really just an extension. The focus might be a little different um, than something we would typically provide, but it's really just the same type of services. Kathleen can correct me if I misspeak, but um, therapies and things like that that we would already be providing in the SUD service network. It's something that's outside? I would, so we because wouldn't, the criminal justice emphasis in the therapy would yes. be outside of what we normally do. Yep, so they okay. might be focusing on something like anger management, like Kathleen had mentioned, or other criminogenic factors that have an impact on recidivism, whereas we wouldn't necessarily cover something like that. Some of the differences really have to do even with housing. The length of time they might house somebody is beyond <laughs> what we currently do, so we'd need to make uh, arrangements around that and agreements, and they would pick up the additional costing of some of the housing. The providers right now provide some of these services, moral rec recognition, no, we're not recognition, rec I can't believe I'm saying, no, it's not reconciliation. Is it recognition? Recognition, recognition, that's it. <laughs> Don't ask me what that is. <laughs> but, you know, Easter Seals and some of the other providers do a lot of that right now in working with people, uh, either whether they're coming from the, the Oakland County Jail system or the prison. I might say I did talk to Christina before we had this session, and normally she would be right in the middle with us. She's at a substance use conference right now, and I indicated that I would let you know how involved she was, but also the fact that uh, in October when we come back, she certainly can speak to more detail around the services and supports that would be provided and covered uh, via our contract with the Department of Corrections. 
question with the northern regions is a lot of uh, tribal entities up that way. Would we be contracting with them separate or would they be included? Are they included in these discussions or no? That I do not know. I do not know all the particulars about which contracts are held in those regions, and that would be something we would look at and take into consideration. I do believe that the Department of Corrections, especially in the Upper Peninsula, has uh, some contracts with the tribes. Well, that there's a lot of uh, tribal entities around Traverse City, for one. I know there's others that I'm aware of, so I was just curious, would they be included in this or not? Right now, the intent would be to assume the contracts that the, the, that the Department of Corrections currently has, and also one of our responsibilities would be to build network capacity if there's a need, and that would include diversity and, and cultural areas. You're welcome. Do you have some idea, Kathleen, what the um, ballpark numbers would be for us in, here in Oakland County? We do not have those numbers yet. Not, I'm in, hearing in the, in the northern region it's about 30 to 40 people a year. The second question had to do with uh, how, how will you track the financial piece of this contract? Does that get rolled into substance abuse? Is, is it separated out? So we would, we would certainly track it all separately because I, I will have to be very careful when we're not reporting any of these services under Medicaid that shouldn't be or Healthy Michigan that shouldn't be. So for our financials, we'll probably put a separate line, but we will track it all independently within our system as well. It would be under, under substance abuse, right? Um, it, it, I, we haven't had those conversations yet. It would be okay. it would be substance use, but it would be MDOC substance use. So okay. it could be a subset of substance use or its own line. I haven't really thought that far yet. There also will be reporting, of course, to the department, not only financially, but certain reports around the number of people served. There's an expectation of supporting people within a certain amount of time. So certain performance indicators will be part of our contract. A question for Anya and then a, a comment. Anya, you said that the fee-for-service was for one year only, and then they're going to decide, or is it for more than one year? Or? So what we had talked about with them was um, looking at some sort of capitated model, but they're not comfortable with that just because we're, they're new to be in a relationship with us. So um, after the first year, we may, we may discuss some of those things. But in, for the first year, they were more comfortable with a fee-for-service model. My comment is it's interesting that for Region 2 and possibly other PIHPs, they're looking to us to possibly manage them. At the same time, they're running pilot studies to turn everything we do over to the, or the money at least for it, over to the Medicaid health plan. So they, maybe they have a multiple personality, the department, maybe they have a multiple personality disorder. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if you're ready to even answer some of these questions. So if you're not, we'll pass by them. Um, the 30 to 40 people, I missed that one. What was that? That was in the northern region. In my conversation with the CEO there, uh, they have uh, either a staff person or somebody who sits on their board who was contracted with the Department of Corrections, and that was the number we heard from them. That those, was the northern region. That is not Oakland County. Those prisoners? Released? People who are exit, yes. People exiting, exiting prison, yes. Is there a uh, eligibility requirement for each of these people? The eligibility would be uh, determined by the Department of Corrections in terms of people they view as needing substance use follow along. So we would be supporting them through that contract. Now they could also then qualify for services through the public mental health system and that eligibility requirement would remain as it currently is. What is value-based uh, funding, and is this a government, federal government pushed project? Well, value-based purchasing is really about paying for outcomes, and so it's looking at um, utilizing funds to make sure that you're not just paying fee for service, for example, more so that you're paying for the outcomes we're looking to achieve 
um, through the provision of services. And is it federal? Yes, I believe the dollars are primarily federal. Also, um, the, um, well, you answered the question about how long the contract is, and that's one year initially? Yes, initially. Okay, and um, yes, one more. October 16th is right around the corner. Will you be bringing a financial analysis of this whole program to the board? Financial analysis will, at this point, be include they're, they're required to cover our costs from a service perspective. So it's a fee-for-service model, and they are agreeing to the rates we are currently paying within our network. The only thing that's really unknown right now is the negotiated administrative rate, which we have not finished negotiating at this point. I'm going to go back to answering my own question about the logistics of this. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, we had uh, the Michigan Department of uh, Delinquency and Aftercare, uh, which I was a, a part of. And we covered the whole state of Michigan from Oakland County, and we did a pretty good job of doing that. So um, you know, it meant some travel, but we were able to very effectively uh, handle the needs of the juveniles uh, who were uh, temporary and permanent wards of the court. It, it did work. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just had another question about the uniformity of race. Um, the negotiations that are going on right now is to get uniformity statewide. Oh, the rates will be region by region because we are insistent on paying the, uh, the same rates that we already pay within the system. So it's that part's really region by region. The administrative amounts will be across the entire state for each region will be consistent. It's basically, I find it a little bit ironic that you're saying stigma might be slowing down the um, active involvement of uh, the more local. And I, I, I find that ironic that somehow or another this would be, it seems a great opportunity to address that, to attack it, rather than handing it off because they find discomfort or unease, I think is the word you used. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. So it's, that's rhetorical, no required answer there. But it just seems odd that a mental health, a public mental health system would somehow or another step away when it is uh, a member, it's part of our community. Correct. So the other thing is irony is a good word. <laughs> the maybe um, not, but in this case, it well that, that was fits. the nicest word I could think of at the moment. So, but um, yeah, I, I find that puzzling. Also, mm -hmm. um, in when you bring back the contract, would it be possible to include? I agree with Eleanor. I'd like to know what our numbers are locally, and also, could you? include some sort of a flow chart that would actually show how, uh, what the relationship is for an individual leading the Department of Corrections. We're, I know that we're the um, single point of entry, but I, I'd like to better understand the flow uh, regarding the staffing and, and who is gonna be involved. And you said that within our provider network, some may, some may not. I'm not sure about that. I, I'm just having a hard time. I love a picture. And so I'm having a hard time putting the words into some format that, that really kind of makes uh, that more clear to me. I don't know if other people feel the same way, but I would really like to see actually how that, like, how that will work for someone who's walking out the door and, and then um, uh, environment. So if that's possible, I would really appreciate seeing something like that. That Certainly, on both and, points. And the numbers, I think, would be helpful, too. For seeing the, the next phase of this, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Our next presentation is the Juvenile Justice Intercept Model. Yeah. 
We're looking forward to this one. Noon. My name is Siri Skora. I'm the Juvenile Justice Coordinator for OCHN, and I'm excited to give you an update about our juvenile justice efforts. It's been a little while that I've presented to you. So, today I would like to present the Juvenile Sequential Intercept model to you. It was something that I was tasked with about two years ago when I first started in my position. Um, we do have an adult version of this, and we quickly realized that the adult criminal justice system is so different from the juvenile justice system. So we felt it was beneficial to create this so that we can really show how the youth move through the juvenile justice system, also where the different intercept points are, where we have the chance to intervene as early as uh, prevention pieces. And also, more importantly, for us to do a gap analysis. Um, this has really given us the opportunity to take a look at where we already have liaisons in place, where have we have services in place um, that cover different intercepts pretty well, but also where we can utilize more forces if, if the funding is available. Because realistically, a lot of our criminal justice uh, liaisons and juvenile justice liaisons are uh, uh, grant funded. So. With that, I would like to move into the Intercept Zero, which is the community interventions. In my opinion, this is one of the more crucial pieces um, because it really focuses on catching kids that are considered high risk um, before they enter the juvenile justice model, uh, enter the juvenile justice system. So some of these programs you might be familiar with. Um, some of these are national efforts, some of these are state efforts. Um, specifically, what I would like to point out to you is under school-based uh, initiatives, Pathways Potential is obviously a known prog uh, program. Youth assistance is something that is very specific to Oakland County. Um, they, it is actually an extension of the Oakland County Circuit Court, but they're placed in the school systems. Through, throughout the last two years that I've been in this position, we've actually been able to establish a referral process with the Youth Assistance Court caseworkers that allows us, well, it allows them to identify kids that are displaying problematic behaviors in the school, but to go ahead and send them to me so that we can get them connected to mental health services early on. Under SUD services, we're trying to cover, um, again, different national and state efforts as well. Provider network is where our access team comes into place if um, this relates to an agency or program where we don't already have a referral process in place. And then under cross-system collaboration, Project AWARE, again, is a very um, uh, known program uh, right across, uh, all across the state right now. And then MAZI2 is a, uh, is a grant that we started participating in last year. So we're going into our second year. It is a specific screening tool that is supposed to be used as, it is a self-reporting tool, but it's with the assistance of someone that is not a clinician. So the idea was that, these, that this specific tool is being used as early as we can to divert kids away from the juvenile justice system. It identifies um, kids that have trauma, it identifies kids that have self-harming behavior, substance abuse. So there's, I believe, seven or eight different domains that this identifies. And like I said, the grant is written where we utilize it as a point to help diverting kids away from the juvenile justice system. So while this is a prevention piece, we actually utilize it just a little bit later, and I will talk about it in about two intercepts. And then you see our community programs, which can be utilized by parents if they want to be proactive. Intercept one, oh, I apologize, is the initial contact. This is usually where some type of arrest happens. Um, it can also be some kind of direct police action that really just means that there might not be a reason for an arrest, but the police was called nevertheless, and uh, they might be utilizing some kind of diversion program on their own. This can be a teen court, so a petition is usually still sent to the prosecutor. They review it, make sure it's appropriate for teen court, but it really is a diversion program, and as long as the kids uh, participate in that program accordingly, no charges will be filed. Use assistance, again, is a diversion program similar to that in the schools. It's just at a later intercept where the kids have already uh, become known to the police force. 
And then, of course, if the police would like to warn and release, that is an option as well. Some police departments, we have found out, um, utilize their own diversions, which is amazing to me that they've been creative enough to come up with something that works for their region. So it might be something that they have already kids that they're known with, but they come up with their own little plan to check on these kids on a regular basis. So this is very uh, locally specific. And then, of course, we can have complaints that come into the intake department at the court. This is usually by parents that are trying to file home incorrigibility charges, schools that are filing court, uh, school incorrigibility or truancy, um, or it might be just by any kind of community member that has observed something in the community and would like to file a petition. In intercepts too, so this depends on how the kids came into the system. Um, of course, if there was an arrest, then we're already talking about an emergency detention, which occurs at Children's Village in Oakland County. And um, if they uh, continue to be detained, um, they have an emergency hearing within 24 hours in front of a referee that also includes the weekends, so they don't have to wait until Monday. Depending if the kids have to continue to be detained, um, there's a variety, as you can see, a variety of different screening tools and assessments that Children's Village utilizes. So they do a very good job of identifying different traumas that the kids have been to, also already identifying risk, fa risk factors about reoffending. And later on down the process, if the kids have to continue to move on throughout the judicial processing piece, Children's Village will actually give a recommendation if they feel like that the use is appropriate for community services or uh, they might have to be looking at out-of-home placement. So the intake piece happens if there was some form of complaint, as mentioned in the intercept one. Um, at this point, the referees have the option, of course, to close the petition and refer to use assistance. Use assistance, if you're not familiar with it, with it provides uh, short-term case management, they provide short-term counseling, they have a mentor program. Um, there's a lot of different services that can come with use assistance as a diversion tactic. Um, another option that the referees can do is that they enter a diversion agreement with the use. That can happen supervised or unsupervised. Supervised simply means that a court case worker or probation officer, if that term would like to be used, um, is utilized to really assist the kid to finish the diversion agreement out and they just feel that there needs to be a little bit of more supervision um, at this point. However, again, if the use completes this program successfully, then all charges are dropped and nothing will show up on their record. Um, Different intervention methods can be utilized at this point, and this is actually where we utilize our um, grant-funded person for, person for the Maisie II that I had just mentioned. So this is where we get uh, referrals from the referees or from the intake court case worker, and the person meets with these kids before they have their diversion hearing and complete the screening assessment to really identify what kind of needs this uh, use might have. They go back into the hearing and they can give a recommenda recommendation as far as what this use could benefit from. Other intervention methods, and with me being actually directly located at the court, they can just call me and say, we have a family here, can you come talk to them? And I've done crisis intervention with families because they have an incorrigible use at home and they're just not sure what to do at this point. So I'm able to do crisis intervention with them. Um, if they're already engaged with a core provider, I can initiate early appointments, uh, let that be with a therapist, with a psychiatrist, just that coordination piece. Once parents become overwhelmed with their kids, they tend to forget how to navigate the system, and this is really where my role comes in. Um, and of course, if the family's not happy with their core provider, then I can assist them in, in switching the core provider if that's an option for them. If the use is not connected to services at all, I can do a access screening or with private insurance and no insurance, of course, provide other resources. And if there's really that need, then a referral to Common Ground for more intense services can always be given. So at this intercept, we have our grant-funded person and myself. As we're moving in intercept three, which is where the judicial processing piece really happens. At this point, the kids have been charged with something. They, they either enter a plea or um, they go into, the, go into a trial. So at this, at, at, I apologize. At this point, they are assigned a court caseworker or probation officer, as the kids like to call them. And um, they complete a social history assessment. So that is the assessment tool that the court has decided to utilize. 
Um, on a weekly basis, we meet for our out-of-home screening committee that I'm also part of. It is hosted by the chief of casework as, case as well as other team members from our core providers in Children's Village and then an out-of-home placement party. And at that point, the court caseworkers come in and they present tough cases that they're not sure of what level of care these kids might need. And as a team, we collaborate what might be the best option for them. Are we talking about the kids being placed on probation? Do they need out-of-home placement? Um, at times, we look at a PA 150, um, which is a specific act that um, means that the youth becomes a ward of the state for up to two years because local resources have been exhausted and the state will continue with the testing and find appropriate placement for them. So at this point, um, the court tends to order um, other services as well, such as a psychological evaluation. Um, they utilize our services a lot where I will do the mental health screenings at this point or substance use screenings as well, especially if there's a concern with the youth having extensive substance use and they might need residential services to address that substance use piece or they will offer or they will order a sex offender assessment through a third party. So this is already when we're in the court processing piece. As we move into intercept four, that is after all the hearings have been completed and the kids are usually moving into the review phase of hearings, um, they've been, at this point they've been placed um, in some kind of community-based services or residential services depending on their risk factor of reoffending, or if the mental health concern is so severe that they felt they were a risk to themselves in the community and they have removed them from the home. So as you can see in the residential services, Children's Village, a um, little bit of a misconception because most people think it's just a detention facility. However, they actually have, I believe, four or five, ooh, I believe it's five uh, programs for boys and then two programs for girls, if I'm not mistaken, uh, varying from secure to non-secure treatment facilities. So we do have that locally. Uh, we also have the Achievement Center, which is through Crossroads for Use in um, Oxford. And then we have private placements. That is really just if the court feels like local resources are not quite meeting the needs of these kids and they might look at uh, different placements outside of the county. And then as I mentioned, we have the Public Act 150 as well. So when it comes to the residential services piece, there's not much that specifically my position can do because the residential uh, program really takes the, the treatment piece over. We will focus on that as when we go into the next intercept where we come back into play to really make sure the kids have services into, in place. Um, in regards to the community-based services, there's different levels of probation that the kids can enter. There's juvenile drug court as well as day treatment, again, through Crossroads for Youth in Oxford. Um, the probation, this is actually the level where my position first came in. The court caseworkers were really needing that assistance and getting kids connected to the mental health services or substance use services to support the probation. Um, a lot of kids are required to enter mental health services as part of their probation, but we also want to make sure that they're appropriately placed with a counselor to address the services that they do need. So this is really where my role initially came into place, and since then we have really expanded to touch on other intercepts as well. So I receive a lot of referrals here from the court case workers to get the kids connected. We do courtesy screenings for the juvenile drug court to provide diagnoses so that the uh, kids can enter the juvenile drug court instead of a probation requirement. And then day treatment, um, we do offer to do the screenings for them as well as long as the court provider can meet with them um, appropriately. And then intercept five, which in my opinion is uh, pretty much just as important as the initial intercept, the prevention piece, because this is where we send the kids back into the community after they might have, uh, might have completed a residential program. So obviously we want to set them up for success. So as you can see under the community supervision part, usually when kids leave a residential program, um, they remain on probation afterwards. That can be as short as three months or six months, something along those lines. And a lot of different parties come into place before they get released back into the community. As you can see, Children's Village has a re-entry team, um, court case workers remain involved, the public health nurse, youth assistance case workers because they cover that school piece. 
Oakland Schools has a new role that is, will um, assist with the coordination piece of getting kids back placed into the schools uh, once they've been, a, been in a residential program. And of course, we come into place. So we've actually updated recently one of our protocols that allows to screen kids about 45 days before they're released from a residential program. Because the last thing that we want is we're discharging these kids back into the community. Now they have to do a screening. Now they have to do an intake. And therapy starts week down, weeks down the road. So by doing these screenings 45 days before they're being released into the community, we're really um, hoping for a smoother transition to once the kid is being released into the community that they already have the therapy, they know their therapist and they can go ahead and start with the therapy piece. So this is really where we're trying to set up the kids for success. We try to cover all the bases from, that's why so many people are involved. Um, it really becomes a family issue as well because this can also address, uh, address transportation issues, making sure the kids are connected to family doctors and so on. Mm. <clears throat> I apologize. So um, as you can see, the, this is a, a really crucial piece, something that we continue to work on, making sure that we have processes in place so we can attend uh, discharge meetings if, if, if they're locally, like Children's Village. If not, again, this is something where we have a referral process in place that we can screen the kids early on. Um, overall, you might have seen the uh, juvenile justice system is very different from the adult system, so we thought it was it would be beneficial to have a juvenile sequential mo model in place. Um, because most parents and most people in general don't understand how kids really move through the system. So the visual helps, it has helped us because from, from my standpoint, I've been able to improve my referral process with different intercept points. And we've, uh, we've been able to catch kids earlier on, um, especially those that are considered high risk or the risk of reoffending. So um, we're hoping to continue the, the good work when it comes to the juvenile justice system and continuing to provide the services to the kids and the families early on. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I wonder if you can um, collectivize the number of children that are involved in all pieces of the system as you talk about each piece. What are we talking about is the total number of children involved in this package? Well, the court obviously collects their own data as far as uh, how many diversions they're doing, how many kids are moving through pretrial, how many are pl being placed on probation. When it comes to my number, I do collect data. So when it I collect data on all the screenings that I, that I successfully complete because I do a lot of coordination. And I apologize, I didn't bring any data today to present to you, but I'd be happy to present that in the future. But um, I would say, as a rough number, I do about 20 screenings a month, which covers all the different intercepts. That might not cover kids that come through access because I have very specific referral sources. So access might cover some of the kids that are already considered high risk that didn't end up in front of me. I'm happy to present more detailed data in the future. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, are you the same young lady that did a presentation a couple years ago with the gentleman from Children's Village? Yes, he was the chief of casework, correct. He's retired by right. now. Um, and at that presentation, you had the, the graph or the chart that showed what numbers of kids were coming from each school district. Has any of those numbers changed? Unfortunately not. So we still have Pontiac, as far as the school district goes, definitely as our highest numbers. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it is followed by Waterford and Avondale. We know that this is taking place, but I'm not sure what we're doing to address those issues. Is, um, as far as things, this is really where um, so what the court is doing is obviously separately than what we have influence over. Um, I'll be honest that we have tried really hard to get into the school districts. And this is where the Maisie, that specific screening tool I had talked about, was supposed to come into play. So we had tried to partner up with use assistant to catch um, the kids earlier on and really implement that. The Maisie has actually, when we had our juvenile um, 
peculiarly going through a staff change there, but our initial uh, screening person for this grant, she had actually trained staff at different so at these high risk schools to utilize the tool. So we've definitely made a little bit of progress there that we can identify these kids earlier on. Um, also, Evandale School District's handle has the program handle with care, which is I'm familiar with it, but is a uh, law enforcement. Uh, it's it's a cross system collaboration, but it includes law enforcement, um, and we continue to focus on these districts. It's it's sometimes it is just hard to penetrate them and really initiate the change that we're hoping for. But it's definitely continu continu continues to be a focus for us. But is there any way you can let us know what some of the barriers are? Because we know people, <laughs> I know people in Pontiac, and, and that's always very distressing to me, that our numbers have been high and stay high. And I can't sit here and hear that year after year and not see anything be, being done about it substantially. I appreciate the fact that you're trying to penetrate. But if it's an issue with the school district, um, I know the, the superintendent of schools. I know the people who are on the board. Whatever we need to do to try to address this, I would like to see something done because it's very distressing to me. I was born in Pontiac, raised in Pontiac, raised my daughter in Pontiac, and I know that it has to be something else going on. It's not just the kids and just the school district. Oh, definitely, I agree, and I'd be happy to bring it back to, not just to my administrator, but also back to the chief of casework and see if there's uh, different things that we can talk about that we maybe haven't considered so far. And identify some of those barriers. Thank you. Siri, um, if a juvenile gets uh, placed in a private placement or a public placement, or detention, does that terminate your services with that young person, or do you have a continued oversight or supervision over that young person? I don't carry a caseload in that sense. I definitely follow the, the kids around, especially if there's continued concerns about, you know, as far as when are they being released, can we go ahead and connect them? In that sense, I don't carry a caseload, though. So it's really about me being in touch with the newly assigned person, let that be of the reentry team or a therapist or a caseworker with where they're going. However, once they enter a private placement, because those are usually several months long, um, at, at that point there's nothing that continues with my services until okay. they're getting back into the reentry phase. Questions or comments? I'd just like to support what Malkai was saying about the schools. Um, that's always been kind of a, almost the beginning of a self-fulfilling prophecy because when you remove somebody from a school environment, they don't always keep up with their schooling. That isn't always a high priority. And the reentry can be beyond challenging. So I think that at some point you, you have started something that doesn't have uh, its own momentum to stop. So I would think that there would be some identifiable barriers in that environment because if you're, if you're not caught up to speed and you don't have maybe world's best coping skills and how to deal with that or to accept extra help or to be somehow separate and uh, identified as different already, I, I, I really do wonder you know, what more could be done to um, make that reentry better? It just seems like to me that's such a vulnerable point, especially for people this age. You know, school is a lot of your life. It's a lot of your social contact. It's a lot of how you see yourself. And um, so that's always kind of bothered me, too, that there hasn't been something that could interrupt that, that cycle a little bit more effectively. Mm -hmm. So that the reentry would be more positive. So I mean that's just me rambling, but I, I that is a, a, a vulnerable spot I think in the continuum of someone's life at that age. I agree. I mean, as far as prevention and reentry goes, those are the most crucial intercepts in my opinion, and that is really where. The focus is also being shifted on considering that some of our position have been grant funded and one specific one has been eliminated because of that. 
we might also lose a momentum, like you're saying, that has been going. So then we have to readjust and, and see how we can continue to cover those areas that we might have covered before. But I agree, the prevention piece and the reentry piece are crucial, and hopefully we can continue to focus on that. I'm so um, really enthusiastic about this whole concept because the prevention is, is mm -hmm. it. You know, I think that it, anything we can do to strengthen that aspect and get better cooperation um, would be awesome for the kids. Really good. Thank you very much for the information. Anyone else who would like to make a, a comment at this point? No? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, our next item is the presentation on the draft of the annual plan and budget for fiscal year 19. Thank you. Last month we had a presentation on the strategic plan and thank you very much for approving that in August. It seems it was longer ago than that but it was a short number of weeks ago and since the approval of the strategic plan we now have the draft annual plan and budget. I think all of you know that the strategic plan is the framework for the next three years, and this annual plan is the first year of our three-year strategic plan. Uh, we have uh, had an extensive review of the strategic plan. We did add um, a 2 the, if I can find it, we added to the core values that we are um, use language that promotes dignity and respect for all people on page two, and we also added to the principles on page three a statement around the fact that the work that we do is grounded in community services, community supports, and inclusion and belonging. So those were the major issues to our uh, core values and our principles from which our and annual plan flows. In the strategic priorities, we identified six areas. Previous strategic plan had seven. And we had made a change in a couple of them. The last strategic plan focused on children and families. That's still included. But we've uh, substituted uh, technology and innovation as a major focus in this three-year strategic plan, so you will see some objectives identified around that. So what I would like to do at this presentation is really focus on the objectives, because those are the priority areas or the focus areas for the next 12 months that we hope to accomplish. Under administration and operations, you will see accreditation, and that certainly has been part of our strategic plan, annual plan for the last number of years. We do intend to a accomplish certification under NCQA or the National uh, Committee on Quality Assurance. We expect to do that sometime in the early, uh, mid next year. Value-based contracting, um, We've talked about that earlier. Uh, that is a uh, transition we've been making over the last number of years. We started that early uh, in our st last strategic plan by bringing in a consultant. And we expect to transition all services to a value-based purchasing service model format uh, in this uh, next fiscal year. And we will also, under objective two on that area, is review our existing contracts or, or existing service models for continuous improvement. In terms of the provider network development and management, we do intend to issue a request for proposal for the core provider agency network, which, as you are aware, will primarily 
consist of uh, case management supports coordination services as well as therapies as of October 1st when we bring in the residential service uh, contracts. Also in that section, we will continue to focus on home and community-based waiver service initiatives. Uh, we have been working on that for several years now. We do have a fair number of corrective action plans and approvals under that, and we do have a timeline, as you probably are aware of, um, under our uh, statewide transition plan that has been expended into uh, 2022, but the department recently issued a letter which indicated that they still want to hold primarily to 2019 and making sure that we have corrective plans, action plans issued and well on our way for uh, approval and uh, accomplishment. Under advocacy, we continue to focus on what we call civil rights and guardianship. We certainly believe in uh, the competency of all people who come to this uh, system for services and supports. Oakland County, as well as other parts of the state, have a large number of people who have guardianship established for them. We're uh, taking a different look at that and focusing on supported decision making. Uh, in the past, it was called alternatives to guardianship. It does pretty much remain that, but we want to move toward supporting people in other ways beyond uh, guardianship as a first option. Under community education, we want to continue to coordinate the advocacy of a work group and uh, have all stakeholders represented. And we want uh, to ensure that we have a commitment of advocating for those areas that stakeholders or people who receive services identify as high need. And I think you can probably expect us to continue a lot of advocacy around Section 298 and the funding of the public mental health system. Objective two in that area is to develop and launch hashtag less labels, more respect, which again, is the anti-stigma campaign, and we really want to move that in high gear around languaging and making sure that we understand language is important. It can create stigma, and it can erase stigma, and that's what we're all about. On the next page, under peer support, so we will continue our uh, focus on increasing the, not only the encounters, but the number of people who are not only peers, but who are served by peers, and we want to increase that by 10%. We know that and acknowledge that there's been discussion and concern around uh, are we losing ground or not with the use of peer supports in our network, and we want to make sure that we hold our ground, and not just hold our ground, but increase that. One of the new areas around peer supports would be recovery coaches through the substance use um, initiative uh, called Project Assert, and some of you may have heard me talk about this. It's to pilot uh, hospital emergency department presence of peers to make sure that people are moved quickly from emergency departments and receive substance use services as needed. Person-centered planning continues to be important. We want to focus this year on increasing the number of independent facilitators, and we also want to participate in the statewide work group around uh, person-centered planning training. I might let you know that that memo has come through from the department, and there will be four of us from Oakland County uh, participating in a limited work group, um, I think three or four meetings, to really set the pace of what training will look like. The department has indicated to us that they expect to do regional training this year across the state. And again, this is part of not only improving person-centered planning, but I think many of you know it was also a recommendation of the 298 uh, task, for, task force uh, group uh, to improve those services for people. Self-determination, the next area was also highlighted, and so we want to make sure we increase the number of people who self-direct services uh, across all populations, 
and we want to create opportunities to increase uh, those arrangements by likely also issuing a request for proposal if we do not see increased numbers across all population groups. We think we need to, to focus on a different way of doing that so we may entertain a request for proposal for an organization who will also take that lead across all populations. Service and provider choices. Uh, we want to uh, upgrade our provider network directory and make sure that there are choices for people and that includes not only uh, taking a look at what services and supports we provide or are needed, uh, but we will do continue to do what's called the uh, needs assessment, an annual needs assessment to make sure that we have a network that is fully capable and available to support people. And we will link that provider network to our website and the person's welcome packet, which is received at the core provider or supports coordination level. In terms of budgeting and finance, Anya, I don't know if you'd like to talk about that. Okay, why don't you go ahead. Um, so we will continue this fiscal year with working to um, implement our financial um, strategy as it relates to um, a balanced budget along with outcomes-based contracts and purchasing um, for all service lines. Um, as you know, we have been implementing those after the past several years. We will be launching the newest one on October 1st um, for the IDD service network. And um, we'll then be starting to focus on the SUD network after that. Um, so we will be um, looking to continue with um, monitoring revenue and expenses. Um, when we get, when I get to the budget document, we'll go through those in a little more detail. Um, and working um, with the the uh, provider network um, as we transition from the historical funding methodologies to the new outcomes-based purchasing models, um, as well as working to continue to support um, direct care staff. As you know, there's currently um, a department-funded $5 million increase in our budget, and then as well as the um, OCHN-initiated $5 million direct care wage increase in there as well. So we're continuing to work on not only um, um, work with direct care staff on compensation, but also strategies related to um, recruitment and retention for those staff. Um, another important area that we plan to work on this year, continuing to work on this year, is funding advocacy. Um, you guys hear me talk all the time about um, our work at the department level with the, the people who sit around the rates setting table um, to really understand the operational side of how, how changes they make at that level are impacting people served um, within the community. Certainly, make sure to continue to advocate for funding and appropriate amounts of funding for all of the system, not just Oakland County. Okay, the next area is healthcare and wellness, and that remains front and center. We do have a care coordination team that uh, is providing some direct service to people we support. We look at a risk stratification or people who have high health care needs as long as along with mental health care needs. And we currently have two nurses on staff who support about a dozen people in consort with the core provider organizations or the uh, case management organizations. Several of those individuals may also be identified along with um, the Medicaid health plans, where we also have an arrangement to work uh, for the mutual benefit of people we both support. We're gonna explore options to collaborate with Owen and the health division around data. I think I talked a little bit about that in the strategic planning discussion. Uh, we are already uh, have a meeting scheduled with Owen to talk about the numbers of folks we mutually support. I think I've indicated that our local FQHC that we hope to launch supports 60% uh, of the people 
that we serve and we want to figure out new ways to move data and information across our systems to do a deeper dive on integrated health care and really take that data and see what we can do to uh, improve the outcomes for people and evaluate that, look at that in terms of uh, outcomes, in terms of predictive analytics and where we might need to develop uh, services and supports into the future. We um, are looking at emergency department and hospital visits. We're going to continue to provide to participate in uh, statewide and regional work groups around uh, the discussion that I think many of you know there was a Michigan inpatient psychiatric admissions discussion, acronym is MyPAD, and there have been a number of recommendations that have come out of that and we continue to work at a statewide level on addressing some of those recommendations. We want to look at telepsychiatry uh, this year for a crisis center and make sure that we work with the hospital systems to move quick people quickly from emergency rooms and into care. Again, population health management, uh, we will continue to work with uh, Care Connect 360, which is the claims data from the department. I think many of you have heard Dr. Lawson talk about the work that we're doing, some of the data, the dashboards, and how we're uh, creating a new services and supports, focusing on su services and supports for people who have some significant health care and psychiatric needs. We focus a lot on the HEDIS measures. Actually, I was just looking at some information that Marquita Massey intends to present later this month, and you'll have the opportunity to see some of those HEDIS measures or health measures that have been identified at a statewide level uh, where we are expected to track those and provide input uh, regarding what's happening in this uh, region, in this county, and then see how it goes in comparison to statewide data. In terms of services and supports, um, this is the area really um, that covers a, a wide gamut of um, issues. Children, youth, and families, we want to make sure that we uh, continue uh, to develop the service models and add incentives to that so that the outcomes expected for children, whether it's home-based or uh, outpatient services, are reached. We want to look again and continue to at, look at and implement the youth suicide prevention. I know we've been very active with the county. We do have a grant that actually runs through our organization to the county uh, for the uh, youth suicide effort, and we continue to be very active in that work. Uh, justice initiatives continue to be, again, front and center. You hear Siri talk about the juvenile justice work that we're doing, but uh, we will continue uh, the work of the Mental Health Diversion Council at a statewide level and co-facilitate actually at a statewide level justice and behavioral health uh, work group initiatives. And I know that Kathy Yonker will be coming back and talking to you more about that. We have, but we had been and have been invited to co-facilitate that statewide group. So kudos to the justice team, as they're called, because they're garnering not only statewide uh, kudos, but certainly at the national level. Crisis services, we, uh, we actually have launched this year the intensive crisis stabilization services. So going into next year, we'll take a hard look at some data, uh, outcomes for services, responsiveness to the community, and tweak those services. Cultural competency, uh, many of you know we've had a five-year plan on cultural competency. I think it was presented to the board a number of years. We will bring that back to you and update you on the uh, accomplishments from that group. We also have the Military and Veterans Family Strategic Plan, uh, Shaka, 
came and presented again not too long ago, and it's pretty remarkable the work that he's doing and the connections that he's making across our county and across the state to ensure that our military families and people who've served uh, receive the highest services. Social determinants of health, there's that terminology that seems to be um, all over the place now. Uh, it is housing, employment, and transportation. We continue to work with Community Housing Network on our what's called the Oakland Housing Link, which is a, a technologically based way of locating housing for people. Actually, we had a meeting this morning. We previewed again the technology, the tool that's going to be used. Uh, you can call up a provider and it'll show every location in the county that that provider is administering. Uh, it'll tell you whether men live there, women live there, uh, how often people go out in the community. It'll give you a very quick view of all the, the parks, the uh, shopping centers located within that particular area. So hopefully in the not too distant future, you'll get a preview of that. I know we haven't shown it to the provider network yet, but we're in the process of scheduling a meeting to um, show them how that will work. Employment, um, we have a lot going on employment. Uh, in, in, in employment, Francisco, again, has presented a number of times. The objective in this area is, quite frankly, to increase the number of people involved in competitive employment. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't a whole lot of other activities that are happening on behalf of people. That just happens to be the leading edge indicator that we're using this year is to increase employment. And believe me, we do have a ways to go uh, to make sure that people are uh, employed in competitive employment. Transportation is another area. You heard me talk about the work that we're doing, uh, conversing with SMART. I believe Mike Daly had conversation. We're going to have a conversation, um, conversation with one of the providers who's been talking to Lyft and how that might be used. So we're working very hard to take a look at all different venues, avenues of transportation to put together a better and more responsive uh, transportation system for people. In terms of substance use and uh, prevention and treatment, um, I know that Christina and a number of people from this organization have recently been reviewing responses, the RFP responses or proposals to recovery housing. So we know we need to increase the availability of housing for people while they're in recovery. And we are also uh, going to work with, this is the nod to the uh, present, earlier presentation, uh, as, as possible, we will establish a contract with the Department of Corrections to manage services through their network. And last, but certainly not least in this area, we'll continue to focus on prevention and treatment relative to the opioid uh, epidemic. The last area is technology and innovation. And I think many of you know that, um, you know, our mantra it lately is any, any service and support that's new that we develop has to have folks from information and technology sitting at the table with us. How do we uh, construct what we do in a way that uh, uses current technology, whether it's Fitbits, Google Home, Alexa, uh, new, every day there's something new that's on the horizon or being launched relative to supporting people so that they can be independent in their homes. But also we need to work with technology so that we can develop the dashboards. We need to do the data collection, data analytics to improve services and support. So we really are looking at technology in a way uh, to advance the latest technology, reminders for people to take their medication, to think about their health, everything from that to the dashboards. So that pretty much covers uh, what 
we want to talk about today in terms of the goals and objectives. I don't know if we want to take a time now to ask some questions about this area. If not, the, the, I, I don't want, the last half of this discussion will talk about the finances related to this annual plan. I think that we are, um, you did a very comprehensive presentation. I think there aren't any comments at this time. If you want to move on to the financial piece, that's fine. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I'm not going to read to you the budget narrative section. Um, much of it is similar to prior years other than to update it for some of the current trends and analysis and things like that that are going on. Um, my preference would be just to walk you through the budget document. Um, I do want to preface this by saying um, this is the budget recommendation from finance. And certainly this is the board's opportunity if, if the board does not agree with the the projections and estimates and, and kind of decisions that are intertwined into this, then we can go back and make some adjustments. The other thing I want to make sure you're aware of um, is that, you know, we, we, have, we did this back in August. I think it was August. So at that time, we didn't actually have the rate certification letters. Since then, we've um, received the rate certification letters with an update as of today. So this is not reflective of those rate certification letters. Um, we're analyzing those right now, and those actually look favorable for, for our benefit. My hope is to have at least some adjustments to you all by ne before next week. So we have, so the problem with doing this in August is I'm guessing for the most part on what the trends look like, what the rates look like, things like that. There's a fair amount of detail that goes into that, but unfortunately, without the actual rates in your hand, it's hard to predict what the revenue is going to look like. So as we're analyzing that over the next week, um, my plan will be to get you an updated document with the updated rate information in it before next week's meeting, because I would rather have you vote on that document, even though it will be slightly different. It is to our benefit, because what it appears to have in it is a, is a different um, trend assumption in the in the rates. So it's actually more revenue than we have projected in this budget. So I would rather go into to the year with that one as our starting point and then we'll watch to see the first couple of months to see what revenue really looks like as it comes in and then probably do an early amendment like we would typically do. That being said, um, I want to um, have you take a look at a couple things. and. Um, it might actually be easier if we first take a look at the document that has the three-year um, financial outlook. The reason I want to have you look at that one is because it gives you an idea of kind of where we ended up with Budget Amendment 2 for fiscal year 18 versus what we're projecting for 19 and then what we're projecting for 20. So if you recall, fiscal year 18, uh, Budget Amendment 2, we did get that late um, appropriation that added about $6 million to the budget. Um, but it really was a year of, of, of soft landing, as we like to call it, where we take the time to utilize our reserves in order to provide transition time for providers and for people served so as to not drastically change people's lives or, or crash organizations. Um, that's historically how we have chosen to manage revenue and expense adjustments. Um, it's certainly not the first time we have done that, and it is something that I think um, it, in the long run is a better approach than some of the other things I've seen go on in PIHPs where they get a rate reduction and push out a 5% five, 5 rate cut the next day. Um, this is a far more planful way to do that, and so there are obvious implications of that where some of your reserves will go down, you have changes in cash flow and things like that. All to, all to say that, um, you know, there is a plan here. <laughs> there is a plan going from Budget Amendment 2 of, le of fiscal year 18 to fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20, and that's kind of my point in including this document in this, in this annual plan, which we have not historically done. Um, so... What you can see going on in revenue for fiscal year 19 as compared to fiscal year 18 is that we do expect some increases. So again, this was done when we didn't have actual rate certification letters, so we did know a few things that were going on. We knew that the appropriation amounts had changed, so what we tend to do in an attempt to estimate what that will look like is, get, is include the amount of the, the proportional amount that we would typically get. 
So we would typically get, let's say, I believe for general Medicaid, it's 9.6% of what the state gets. So if, we, if the state got $60 million, our proportional share of that, that's how we kind of do it without rates, is, is to add that in there along with what we expect for eligibility trends. So as you're aware, we've seen a decline in the DAB eligibility trend. So we, we plan for that. And so the, these rates do include a continued drop in the eligibility trend for the DAB population. At some point, that will stop dropping. At some point, we will see that end. And I do also think that as we start to see people hit the 48-month mark with Healthy Michigan, we, we hopefully will see people move back over to the DAB population because that's when people are going to notice that it, the coverage really isn't the same. So they're going to start to notice that at 48 months, you either have to move on to the um, insurance exchange or contribute out of pocket, whereas on full Medicaid, that's not a requirement. So my hope is, is that after this 48-month period and people start to hit that, that they will move back to the, to the DAB population and therefore our revenue would be reflective of that. Um, we don't have any of that predicted in these rates. We only have it predicted to go down because you know typically what I will give you is worst case scenario. So as to not have to come back to you and tell you it's in more shape. <laughs> um, so what you can see in, um, the fiscal year 19 projection, you see our estimate um, for the increase to the autism revenue. So as you are aware, autism, um, the appropriation went up uh, materially in fiscal year 19. The other thing that did happen with autism revenue is there was a cap placed on the um, rate for behavioral techs. So this is the department trying to control how much we, that people are paid despite the fact that there are still challenges with capacity. So unfortunately, that while we did get an increase to the appropriation, there was a cap placed on the behavioral tech rate. Um, so what happens when they do that is you basically don't get credit for anything paid beyond that. Um, moving down, um, you can see SUD. There was a, about a million dollar increase in, in that particular fund source. So that would be SUD, Medicaid, and Healthy Michigan. And then... Um, the adjustment there for DAB of 6.1 million. So the department originally told us it was about 6.4 million, but what we see more, more accurately is about 6 million, 6.1 million, related to that $60 million late appropriation they did in fiscal year 18. Um, the last one that you see there listed says potential HMP adjustment, so that's Healthy Michigan. So we knew that there was a slight increase to the appropriation, and so we expect that to be about a million dollars. So again, as I mentioned, these are all our estimates based on prior to having actual rate certification letters. Um, now that we have those, we run each, each individual rate through our rate cells with age, gender, geographic factor, and all of the different factors in order to really pinpoint exactly how much we think we're going to have. And that's what's going on right now because, again, we just did get new certification letters this morning. Um, that being said, uh, it does look favorable for us um, with the new certification letters. The trending assumptions that are in there are higher than what we had originally heard. I can tell you all the reasons I think that is, but it's not necessarily relevant to this particular discussion. Um, so you can see our Medicaid revenue does go up for fiscal year 19 from um, a projected amount of about two, um, 284 million. That's about a $14 million increase. Also note that in fiscal year 18, we had that death adjustment, which hopefully was one time, and we're not going to see them do that again um, because we believe they're doing that every month. So we'll be keeping an eye on that to make sure that's happening. Uh, moving down to general fund, this was to be the first year of the general fund reduction for the implementation of the new methodology. However, there was an appropriation to hold harmless those, those counties that um, we're going to get the reduction. Whether we'll have that in the following year or not, I don't know. That's why you see in fiscal year 20 that $1 million reduction, because we don't know right now if we'll see that. We know for this year we'll be held harmless. Um, moving down to county match, that has not changed. That's still the same $9.6 million it's always been. OBRA re revenue is basically a fee-for-service model. Um, we, we bill it, they reimburse us. 
grants did go up materially, and that's primarily due to the clubhouse grant you've heard me talk about, um, where it, it's intended to um, serve the population that was that was transitioned out when we received general fund cuts. So should people want to come back into service to receive those clubhouse services, there is a grant to cover that. Um, income from, his, um, from investments has gone down. Um, that's primarily just due to um, us utilizing some of our investments in order to manage cash flow and um, the deficit spending in fiscal year 18. Uh, miscellaneous doesn't change terribly. Uh, resource and crisis center goes down slightly. That's just about maintenance and utilities and things like that. Um, we just take the, the prior year's annualized amounts and make a new estimate for the next fiscal year. Um, we do have built into fiscal year 19 some tenant revenue. That's roughly, um, a, a, I believe it's about a quarter's worth of tenant revenue because we still have to do some build out. We're very close to getting one of the larger tenants signed, I believe, which will in turn have another smaller tenant signed. So we should um, hopefully get to start working on that stuff pretty soon. We're just working out the details of the lease. So, um, Finally, we have SUD revenue, which is almost exactly the same at um, 9.8 million. Again, that one is block grant and PA2 funds. Um, so what you see there for total revenue, you see the difference uh, from 307 up to $322 million. So moving down to expenses. You see system administration. So there's a couple things going on in there that you um, see that, that are causing that difference. Part of that is the depreciation on the building. Part of that is the staff we are, have to add in order to take on the direct service contracts. Um, so you got a couple of those things going on in there. The depreciation on the building will be offset by the tenant revenue. So while we see more of it this year, as, as we get more tenants, you, that will be offset. Um, moving down to program and other, you see, as you remember, we've moved this now toward, more towards a service line um, layout. So what you see there is ABA, which is the autism benefit, um, along with the increase in revenue. We, there is expected to be an increase in expense. Again, we do still have a waiting list, so we are working to get um, that resolved and um, do expect to add people um, and, and have an increase in the service service expenses there for the fiscal year. Core provider adults, what you see going on there is um, a continuation of the historical amounts with the, with the removal of the CLS and specialized residential because this, is, this will be the first time you'll see it in the budget with those being um, directly contracted with us. So what happens there is we remove, re, we remove the expense from the core provider lines, and you'll see them later on in the, in the expense line. But what we also have going on is that there is associated administration that will be coming back to us related to that. So that's what you see there is that $4.7 million is the associated administration for both residential, CLS, and then from vocational, because we did not make an adjustment when we did the vocational um, contracts. So all of that is right there in that $4.7 million. In addition, we do plan to see some savings with service models over the next fiscal year, hopefully. Um, so that's what you see going on there with that $1.1 million, um, which is really primarily just about consistency and rates across providers, because historically there was not. Um, and so with the consistency of rate we, rates we and um, the 2% cap on profits, we actually do expect to see some savings in fiscal year 19. Um, crisis services did go up. Um, that is primarily due to um, the children's crisis, mobile, children's mobile crisis unit, if I got that right. Um, and I believe an addition, if, if I'm recalling correctly, to the um, crisis center uh, expense as well. For kids, you see there, that expense does go down. Again, that's, that's much, much of that is because of an adjustment to service models. They implemented service models on April 1st of, the, of fiscal year 18. So we do expect to see some savings from that. Um, we are already seeing that even within fiscal year 18, we are seeing some savings um, from providers. 
Um, state facilities, we expect to be roughly the same. Um, we are only responsible for the county share portion of that. Um, at this point, we used to have that much larger expense there, but that the department has taken that back over. That was part of the GF reduction, about $10 million. Housing services does go up. What you're seeing, that increase is because of the Oakland, Oakland Housing Link. <laughs> All of the acronyms I have to say. Um, so that's what you see it being adjusted there is the increase to that the CHN contract for that particular um, software and um, the usage of that um, throughout the network. Substance use, um, it looks like it goes, it's almost flat exactly. We expect that not to change terribly. The rates aren't planned to change or anything like that, so we expect that to be consistent with prior years. Grants is where you see a material increase. Again, that's because of that um, clubhouse grant. I don't actually think we'll spend the entire million dollars, but it is there, and grants we typically present as a, as a wash, same amount in as the same amount that goes out, just because if we don't spend it, we have to give it back. So either way, it's, it's really a wash for us. Purchase service other is kind of our catch-all um, um, line item. So this has things, some of the smaller contracts, our contract with um, Arab American Chaldean Council, um, it came up recently, um, the contract we have had with Oakland County for psychiatric services at Children's Village is housed in Purchase Service Other. Our training expense line for training of the network is housed here. Um, it's just a lot of little smaller things. If at any point you all want to see that list, you are welcome to see it. Um, but that has gone down a little bit over the years. It used to be a lot more, um, but you can see we continually drop it a little every year just because, you know, we've tight tighten things down and, and try to really make sure it's, it's only necessary expenses that hit there and, and anything we don't spend, we try to make sure that we're reinvesting elsewhere. We do have a small um, line item there for technology investments so that as technology becomes available, we have the opportunity and a line um, budgeted to be able to start um, involving ourselves more and more in different technology solutions. Um, and then you'll see Resource and Crisis Center again. Oh, I skipped one, didn't I? Um, claims tax is actually changing to a different kind of tax. I believe it's IPA tax. Um, so the, the department switches that out all the time. It's one tax or another. It's a pass-through for the most part. Um, this one is now called the IPA tax. I actually don't know what it stands for. Uh, the resource and crisis, oh, local match drawdown expense, um, that's basically a requirement of our local money that each, each CMH is required to pay the department to draw down additional Medicaid funds, which they did finally add to our contract after they realized many of us were questioning having to do that after a period of time, and it wasn't in our contract. So that is now in our contract, and that's just um, an amount we send on a quarterly basis up to the department to pull down additional Medicaid dollars. Um, resource and Crisis Center, again, you can see that's dropped just slightly again, and that's just um, um, maintenance and utilities and things like that on the Resource and Crisis Center in addition to the expense for the bond. Um, I think we have about 12 years left on that bond, maybe slightly less than that now. Um, down one more is the board designated Owen, so that is our contract with Owen along with um, what we spend with them for psychiatric services and medication for the population that was discharged with the general fund reductions, we do have an amount in that contract in order to serve them should they need psychiatric services or uh, medication. Um, below there is the direct care wage increases. So you, the first line item is the Oakland initiated one, which we started in fiscal year 16 and have continued since then. It is our assumption that you want to continue that, and so that is built into this budget. And following that is the MDHHS initiated um, direct care wage increase, which is not a choice for us. It is mandated that we utilize that money for that purpose. Um, finally, vocational and non-vocational. So this is where why you see that one go up that much is not necessarily because we're spending additional money. It's because in fiscal year 18, the first quarter was budgeted with core provider adults. And um, 
only nine months of it was actually in the vocational line item. So what you're seeing there is the annualized amount now sitting with um, that particular line item. And when I talked about removing residential and CLS out of the core provider contracts. That's where you'll see it now. You see it's roughly $79 million um, that is spent annually on CLS, and that is continuation budget from the prior year. Um, um, with the with the residential and CLS providers. So, all of that to get us a pro, total expense of three hundred and six million dollars, or I'm sorry, three hundred and twenty-five million dollars, which on this document will show you roughly a two point eight million dollar deficit. As I mentioned before, the document we have received from today does is is favorable favorable for us related to rates. So my hope, as I said, is to have you information prior to next week that updates this to reflect that. Um, we have been fortunate that I think that the department is recognizing the challenges that the over the last several years with the system losing $133 million in fiscal year 17 and then fiscal year 18 being just as challenging with the DAB issue and then rebasing prior to that. So. Um, I think that's what we're seeing is is the the recollection of that and the 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 appropriations that we talked about earlier in the budget. Um, do you want me to pause there and we take questions? I assume you all have questions. <laughs> and yeah, um, on page eighteen, going back to the purchase of services, others. Mm -hmm. I, I was made aware that we were reducing some of the services that we provide to Children's Village and then I inquired to Kathleen and she informed me that it was we were paying for half of a psychiatrist and now we're not going to be doing it anymore. Is there any reason besides that we've been that our budget's been cut that we're not no longer providing it or any because I wasn't even aware that we were providing it then I found out we weren't providing it. So I just thought the board should be aware of what's going on something like that. It has been budgeted, however, we're still in negotiation with the county on what that might look like. So we don't know yet if we're uh, going to get a, um, an answer from the county that they're willing to pick up the entire cost, at least for a period of time, or if they're going to pick up a reduced cost. So we're still negotiating that number. They quite frankly in terms of the children's village psychiatric supports they would need to provide that anyway so we have entered into a mutual collaborative effort to fund that and have been doing that probably for about four years my question is, is just what is different now than it was last year i know it's seventy five thousand dollars right which is not in our in our budget that's not a lot of money but like, why last year we wanted to fund half the psychiatrists and now we want them to take over more? What's changed? Well, certainly we've been looking at our bottom line. We have had reduced funding over a number of years and we have actually continued to fund that when we, we we've had previous discussions about that, however that had continued. So every year is a new year to look at negotiation of that number and that's what we're doing right now. I had a question about the um, CLS, not CLS, the residential contracts um, that we're taking over as of October 1st. Are we hiring any of the people from the core agencies that were providing those services now that we're taking them in-house? So when, when we um, post positions for any of these, as we've onboarded, anyone is open to apply, and certainly people with experience are, are uh, helpful in these types of transitions. So if, if, if that does work out, um, that is certainly helpful. Um, it's never been, we haven't taken, we didn't approach it the same way we did with some of the other transitions where we took staff over. Um, and that's just because this this was a slightly different um, situation where it's really about contract management and, and a network management piece as opposed to actually providing the the function where in UM that's what we did. So, as of October first, we are we ready to do what we need to do, and are we fully staffed? 
we're in the process of adding the last few. Um, so we waited as long as possible to post a lot of them just because of the, the funds, when, when the funds actually switch over. So we didn't want to um, bring them in too early, but we also have brought a couple in earlier on um, in order to manage the project in and of itself. So is it possible for us to know how many people, if any, from the core agencies were brought in in-house? Um, I don't know that number. I don't know if others do or not, but we can ask. We can get you both the numbers that mm -hmm. may have been added to manage the network, as well as I think you're asking specifically, has anybody from the provider or network agencies. been hired? So you, we'll get you both. If we took it in and they not, they're not doing those services there, that means the loss of employment. At the at the core provider level, right? Right, and we we what what we always do is make sure that core providers ha get the postings that we have, so that if there are people that wanted to apply, um, those are provided to each each provider agency, and we we are hopeful that some of them would have or did apply. No, if some did, mm -hmm. thank yes. you. I, I, for a fact, know some applied. Whether they, I'm not. I don't typically sit on the interview panels. I do. I did hear that that, that a couple did apply. Thank you. So, just so for clarification, um, the change in net assets—that's really net cash, correct? Net assets, cash. This does not reflect cash. Yeah, so that's a total change in net assets. It's not specific to cash. We would have to have a cash flow statement specific to look at cash. Um, like uh, we are planning to use it at this point. What where Owen is 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 they have. Um, at the locations that they are at, they are at capacity where they can't serve anymore. So that is the underwriting amount that we will continue to, to utilize, at least for this fiscal year. There is at the change in net assets, not the not the resulting assets. So that's the change in net assets from the prior year, not what we will have left in net assets. That's what we expect to have re expense over revenue in each each fiscal year. Those are deficit numbers. That is the amount that is the expense in excess of the revenue brought in. But as I mentioned, the rates we have received today will change that number. The other question I have is tenant income administrative offset. When you speak about offset, it the revenue of the tenant income on this report. It, in the green, right above SUD other? So if you look where it says total revenue, so if you're looking in the revenue section, it's towards the bottom. On my document, it's green, but I don't know if yours are in color. Is that I see it. That's 200. So that's, oh. that's revenue, right? Yes. Where is the offset? So the expense sits in our administrative line, and that's why you see our administration go up. That is partially because of the depreciation on the building and partially because of the additional staff we've added to take on direct service contracts. So the build out, is that considered That's how we expense the build out is through depreciation, which is in our administrative line, yes.
as I mentioned, I'm, I'm planning to have this updated to you before next week because I want you to be able to vote on, on the most current document I have, but it, we got those letters today. So unfortunately, um, we did not have the time to update with the, the certification letters that will change these numbers. Again, I, it is favorable, so it's not bad news. <laughs> um, um, in addition to that, once, as I mentioned, what we will do is we will we will make estimates for what you will approve next week and then probably wait a couple of months in and then do a budget amendment to more accurately to make sure that that's what we're actually seeing come in. I'm always a little leery of doing that before we actually seeing revenue come in. And then just for note, we are they, the department is adjusting our geographic factor starting in January. Again, that's one of the, when you heard us talk about the DAB revenue and how they weren't going to give us any and all of that data push that we had to deal with. Um, I am monitoring that myself on a weekly basis to make sure that we are accurately reflecting um, the population being served. So again, that should have a positive impact on us going forward. Um, so if that being updated will again change our rates as of January. We'll have to do a, an amendment after that once we see um, this year might be three budget amendments just because of several of these things changing. Okay, and then I'm going to skip over the pie charts because I assume you all are pretty familiar with those. We do those every year. Um, um, from a pay, on page 24, provider agency contracts structurally contracts are not changing. They're st the format is is staying consistent where we have the standard boilerplate language in the main document and then have attachments that are specific to financing any delegated functions, reporting requirements, and all of that, that's not changing. It's all consistent and outlined there. Um, if you have any questions, certainly we can answer them. The only other thing I do want to review with you is I'm not going to review with you the entire list of grants. I'm just going to point out to you the new grants um, because our list of grants is uh, growing. Um, as I mentioned several times, the Clubhouse grant of a $1 million, um, we, we did receive. In, in addition to that, we do have the Children's Intensive Crisis Stabilization Grant, which does fund a position to help coordinate and, and get that project moving. So those are the two additional grants. The rest of them are all renewal grants. So have are things we have been doing for years. These are always a wash it because if we don't spend it, we can't keep it. So there's very little um, um, goes on around these because it's the, ex the revenue in and the expense out. Anybody have questions on any of the grants or anything else? I just wanted to ask again, can you go over your role and your team's role in terms of rates and how they get set? Okay. Oh. My role in particular related to rates as far as rate development is I sit on the, the rate setting committee with the department and the other PIHPs where we discuss how the rates are set, what, what factors are included. Um, we talk about the geographic factors and the needs of the system, um, DAB issues, things like that. Um, so I represent our, our organization in that rate setting group. So then what happens is once they set those rates, those have to be approved by CMS as actuarially sound. Once those are approved, they then come back to us in those rate certification letters. Um, and what my, myself and my team does is take those rates, plug them into the population we serve, and then predict month by month um, the amount of revenue that we will receive from each of those rates? Does that answer your question? Right, and is there negotiation involved? Are you trying to uh, get across to the state the needs of yes. our area? And so so on? one of the things, that the, the DAB, the late DAB adjustment with the appropriation was about advocacy. That was everyone going to the, the legislature and to the department saying there's something going on. We, we provided an analysis. We talked it through with them several times over. Again, with autism and autism revenue, we have taken a loss in autism since that benefit began. So we will hopefully finally this year not do that. Um, so it is. It's a negotiation, to, and but it's also about them understanding 
um, the system and how it works and some of the impact of some of the decisions that they make and how they distribute money and what happens when they do those things. So yeah, it, it's a negotiation, not like your typical negotiation, but it is, it's helping them understand kind of the impact of some of the things that they're, they're doing at that level. Yeah, we, well, we do it every, every other month we meet, so we, we do it pretty often. <laughs> Remember one other thing I wanted to ask when you talked about the healthy Michigan people transitioning back to DAP. Is it any way possible for us to start um, talking to the people early so that they would be prepared or at least know that this is something that they should be considering doing? Otherwise, it's going to cost them more for their services or for their insurance. Um, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if if people's case managers do that as they go through re-enrollment. It, like, it seems like we had a conversation about that. I'm not remembering the detail. I don't know if, Kathleen, you have anything to add. Actually, when we became aware of this significant shift in the cost to the system statewide and certainly to us, we went back to the core providers and said, please, you know, talk to the people receiving services if they have enrolled via Healthy Michigan when indeed um, a regular Medicaid application through the, through the DABS uh, process would be more appropriate, we try to get them to immediately switch because then that creates a stronger financial history for us as opposed to waiting, waiting till the end. You know, getting $60 million back from $130 million doesn't make us whole, so the quicker we can do that. So whether it's through person-centered planning process at that time when re you review uh, the resources that people bring to the table, including those types of applications, entitlements, then we need to do that. We have also talked to the MARA workers uh, to assist, the, assist people, assist the core providers in making sure people make that shift quickly. So we really don't want to wait to the end, but nonetheless, as we come to the end of those months, yes, we will create uh, talking points and an initiative to make that happen. You're welcome. Um, so two things. Uh, most of the population that were in the wrong category, they were, weren't really the folks we serve. They're really just county residents. Is that correct? The percentage of them? No, not necessarily. Um, we see a lot of people that we were serving that had moved from, from being a DAB-funded person to being a Healthy, healthy Michigan-funded person. Most control over, but we don't really have control over the folks that are regular Healthy Michigan or uh, regular Medicaid that are being served by, gosh, I don't even want to say their names, but. No, so if, if they don't receive services from us, obviously we wouldn't have control over what, what coverage they have, but um, we, did, we did have a conversation with the MARA workers who process all of the paperwork and things like that and are certainly, um, it, unfortunately, it's an unintended consequence of Healthy Michigan and people will find out when they basically hit that 48 months and, and either have to pay more or have to go to the exchange. I know that Meridian didn't have the same kind of focus on doing things like that. They probably should have for their folks. But, so the other thing that you mentioned a few minutes ago had to do with autism. And if I remember when that program was first deployed to the counties, um, it wasn't a capped program, so I think you guys said we were actually, we weren't, we never make money, but we weren't facing a loss because whatever, whatever it costs for assessments, we were able to charge and pass that on. Is that oh, originally, we were cost settled completely for autism in its first couple of years. Then they moved it to a fee-for-service model, and then as of fiscal year 18, moved it into our capitation payments. So we have... Once they moved it out of totally cost settled, we have taken a loss on it. This year, with the adjusted revenue, we should not. So, okay. So the current year we're in the fiscal year is the one that we're. 
Yeah, we're it's about a, it's about three million dollars that we're taking a loss on for that population. The loss is coming out of IS. It, well, no, it it it, has it hits our numbers. bottom line of or the deficit, but it essentially is Medicaid money that is used to cover it. Uh, it's going along because Jonathan asked pretty much what I was going to comment on. Most of the people in Oakland County that are either on Healthy Michigan or Medicaid, we get a carve out of that. But we have no control over, only have control over the people that we're serving. So most of the people that are on Medicaid and Healthy Michigan, hopefully the, from Healthy Michigan, are going to find out they want to switch back to Medicaid. We don't have any way to get to them early or anything. They're, they're people we don't know. They, they're not getting CMH services. So that's, I think, what Jonathan was pointing at. There's, we have our own MARA workers for our own people. But we don't have MARA workers. Maybe we should hire 20 MARA workers and just spread out into the county and get everybody that's on Medicaid. That's the unfortunate impact of a system that's funded based on eligibility instead of enrollment. Um, it's you know, different than when uh, the economy gets better, eligibility drops, which means our revenue drops, except for the population we're serving doesn't. So those are the things that we, te we tell the actuary. <laughs> Thank you. So we're trying to juggle this stuff. So, comment. Um, it's anecdotal, but it's happened to me in terms of people contacting me lately. When you talk about the DAB migration, some of it is it's not people opting for a more simple route. The Medicaid determination and redetermination. It's pretty strident. It is people whose income has changed due to either uh, starting to receive a survivor benefit because of the loss of a parent, or the, the uh, parent has retired, and the amount of money that uh, the disabled adult child, that's not my language, trust me, but uh, as a, a DAC, they, they were bumped from Medicaid and shifted to Healthy Michigan. And they have mixed feelings about, they don't understand. I try and explain that there's an, uh, you know, an, an end to the healthy Michigan piece. But a lot of them don't really want the battle. It, it's, it's so stressful and it's so prolonged that they really don't want to do that. Not until lately, I didn't have a sense that there were people that were being migrated forcibly from Medicaid, inappropriately forcibly migrated from um, Medicaid to Healthy Michigan because the computer spit out when the, the number that they were receiving hit the limit, they automatically got moved to Healthy Michigan. And one of the things we're trying to incentivize now, I believe it's in the employee is um, training on benefits and things like that and how to protect assets where appropriate so that those things don't happen. There are, I mean, there is a little known aspect to that where if you are deemed a disabled adult child that some of the numbers don't matter the way they would if you applied later, you know, to be uh, Medicaid eligible and then you would be only Medicaid or Healthy Michigan eligible that way. But um, there, there is some confusion, and there's reluctance to kind of insert yourself into a process that's months long and very frustrating. So, I mean, it's a bit of a catch-22, I suppose. But, I mean, it wasn't their idea to just take an easier way out. They, they got the letter that said, guess what? Healthy Michigan eligible no longer met. There are so many factors, so many moving parts, I guess, to this migration. So. Okay, you will then walk us through the update at the board. Okay, great. Uh, because I do expect it to change, I would rather you have the updated, and we'll walk through it again. Appreciate the narrative. Uh -huh. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you very much. And just a reminder, at the board meeting, there will be an action item around this and a request for approval. Thank you.
I saw that the second opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone here who would like to make comment at this time? Um, I did ask Victoria to send out the draft bylaws and policies, and I thank Christine for giving them a review as well. Um, please let me know. I've only heard from one person, and that person is satisfied with them. But we would like this to be an action item on the board at, uh, agenda. So I would like to hear from you if you accept the changes as presented. So if you could let Victoria and I know, I'd appreciate it. I have a question for Christine Burke. I would like to purchase some um, cookies because I have imp in, um, I'm imp implementing the less labels, more respect into our anti-stigma program, and I'd like to know where I can get some cookies, please. I'll speak on her behalf, and we'll make sure she gets you that information. Thank you. One additional, uh, we have a study session in September that's on the calendar, but I do not have any topics. Right now, October is booked. So if you have any suggestions or anything pressing that you feel should be covered at the September study session, please let me know as soon as possible. Other board member comments at this point? Seeing none, hearing none. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.